India innovation. Um, for many of you who've been tracking us, we've been tracking the great progress that India has been making in terms of ramping up its strength in innovation. We all know that India is a, an amazing country in terms of its ability to supply and make generics. Actually, over the past decade, if we just look at ANDA or generic filings with the FDA, India accounts for over 35% of those filings and recently has overtaken the United States as the number one country in the world on generics. But that's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about innovation, of which there are some promising signs and some challenges. Challenges include the relatively low per capita R&D spend in India. It's, it's 20% of that in countries like Germany and Japan uh, and, uh, and slightly more relative to China. Um, but there are some very encouraging signs. And one of the encouraging signs that I'll point out is the number of Indian students that are actually studying abroad. Just last year, 750,000 Indian students studied ab abroad, 28% of which were in the United States. It was actually the second um, leading country for international students across the world. So with that said, we'll very much look forward to the panel. I have the great privilege to introduce Sanat Chapa, Chapa Dapade. And I think I've gotten your name correct, uh, Sanat. I practiced it intensively <laughs> over the weekend. Sanat is the head of one of the greatest, um, most iconic manufacturing divisions across all of industry at Merck. And before I hand it over to you, Sanat, I'm just struck by a line that was espoused by Pfizer and Albert Borla over the last year. And it was a line from the great founder of Merck, George Merck, who said that if you make great medicines, the profits will follow. So now I'll hand it over to you for India Innovation. Thank you, Andy. Thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you all. Welcome to the session on India Innovation Panel. Uh, as you have seen, we have a very distinguished group of panelists whose bio have already been posted in the website. They are Amitabh Khan, Chief Executive Officer, National Institution for Transforming India. Dilip Sangvi, Managing Director, Sun Pharmaceutical Industries Limited. Hari Bhartia is, of course, not being able to join today. Professor Vijay Raghavan, Principal Scientific Advisor, Government of India, and Dr. Naresh Trehan, Chairman, Medanta Hospital. As you, as you heard from Andy, we all know that necessity is always the mother of invention. And we have seen the world coming together on a war footing to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. We are witnessing scientists and medical technology developers leveraging innovations to launch a scientifically rigorous response to the novel coronavirus. And with the COVID-19 pandemic causing massive disruptions in our healthcare system, many Indian innovators are rising to the challenge. It's well known that India is one of the largest producers of vaccines in the world. But now what we see is COVID is resulting in innovative vaccines being discovered and produced indigenously in India. And the best example of that is Covaxin. That's simply fantastic. COVID-19 crisis has also created new partnerships for example, between Serum and, you know, first AstraZeneca, then Novavax, and we have now the collaboration between J&J &J and BioE, and there are some more. So in other words, COVID-19 has brought an unprecedented sense of urgency to the evolution of scientific innovations and technical cooperations. From the conception of an early idea or a prototype to mass production and on-ground deployment of the innovation. And the need of the hour is for the government, industry, and academia to leverage this newfound innovation of efforts for a sustained ecosystem of innovation in India. We are witnessing the immediacy of the present situation enabling that innovation at all levels, be it increased funding from the public and the private sector or faster regulatory approvals, and therefore, I would dare say that it will be prudent for governing bodies to start laying the guidelines 
that should allow all these newfound changes in the innovation ecosystem to persist even beyond the pandemic. So, so let, me, let me start with Amitabh Khan and Vijay uh, Raghavan. Amitabh and Vijay, uh, during the pandemic, we have witnessed very strong partnerships between the government, the healthcare, tech entrepreneurs, patient groups, with the pharma industry. And that includes ensuring supplies of essential medicines, digital mapping of resources, setting up dedicated hospitals. We also know that the future respiratory pandemics may have new features that may take longer to identify. And, and they may be vaccine recalcitrant. So it may be important to consider how we can have very strong yet operationally viable non-pharmacological non -pharmacological interventions, you know, like, like uh, high quality masks with HEPA filters that can be speed, speedily and inexpensively deployed widely can be used to allow healthcare and frontline workers to function at full capacity. So given all of these things, may I request both of you to comment on the measures that are being put in place to combat a potential wave three of the pandemic and if you can also touch upon the post-COVID opportunities for India in R&D and manufacturing. And to that extent has COVID pushed India to seriously focus on biopharma innovation and R&D. Amitabh, can I request you to go first, yeah. please? Yeah, when COVID uh, struck India, you know, we were not manufacturing uh, PPEs. We were not manufacturing ventilators. Uh, but with support of private partners, India has developed the technical capability to manufacture ventilators, oxygen concentrators, PPEs, sanitizers. Surveillance mechanism has been strengthened to capture and monitor disease outbreaks in different regions. Indian SARS COVID 2 uh, genome sequencing consortia, INSACOG, has been set up by the government for large scale sequencing of viral genome to identify variants of concern. Oxygen production capacities have been enhanced and oxygen transport facilities have been established. Uh, we've setting up a vast number of PSA oxygen generation plants in hospitals, 551 of them to be exact across the country. Uh, mobile ICU bedded facilities with well-equipped medical devices and sanitation protocols are now being set up by different states in rural and remote regions. And vaccination for 18 years and above is being driven on a war footing. Uh, just yesterday, we've uh, done close to about, uh, you know, at the 8.2 million vaccinations at the, you know, which has been a record of sorts. And uh, with this momentum, we'll be able to vaccinate majority of the people in coming months. Civil society organizations are all supporting government in combating the pandemic. Uh, we have more than about 113,000 civil society organizations that are partnering the government. And, uh, you know, all this has been possible uh, because we worked in collaborative partnership with the civil society, the private sector, uh, everyone together. Uh, you asked about uh, R&D initiatives and our view is uh, that right now Indian pharmaceutical industry is currently valued at about 42 billion US dollars and we are, uh, our aim is that we should make it a 200 billion dollar uh, segment by 2030 and innovation is required in biopharma segments. We feel that there are moonshot areas such as biosimilars, often drugs, complex generics, vaccines, fresh medicine and antivirals, which have the potential for innovative drug discovery and development. We are looking at ways to incentivize research in biopharma and help India transition from a, a generic player, a, a high volume generic player to a high value, high volume player in the global pharma market. And research incentivization will enhance innovation in the country, boost exports, and create high skill employment. And um, we are also supporting uh, all leading international companies and scientific communities, uh, which have the required uh, technical skills to collaborate with India for R&D in several moonshot areas. We've partnering 
private sector in R and D, and currently, uh, you know, research consortiums have been successful in finding candidates uh, for COVID nineteen vaccine, and similar strategies will be taken up to drive innovation in drug discovery and development of medical technologies uh, to further strengthen the research ecosystem. Industry and academia are collaborating, and we are. Uh, incentivizing research as well but my belief is that indian pharmaceutical sector is private sector driven the government acts as a facilitator and catalyst and we'll do everything possible to make this a top class sector the key sector of india's growth and take it to a 200 billion dollar us market uh, by 2030 and we will make innovation the hallmark of this sector thank you amita thank you Vijay, what's your take on this? You are on mute, Vijay. What uh, Amitabh has done is to really comprehensively state what the situation is now in terms of our tech and pharma and biotech industry and what the way forward is. And you know, that's really beautifully said and one can't add to that. What I will try and do is to address uh, one of the aspects of your question, which is, what does one do going ahead in terms of dealing with future pandemics uh, or future new kinds of waves? Now, one important point to be kept in mind, which you've mentioned in respiratory pandemics is no matter what the nature of the epidemic or pandemic, high quality filters in buildings and on people can have an immediate impact, particularly on healthcare workers and frontline workers, allowing them to attend. Uh, to the problem. And this is something which we must understand and scale up nationally and globally. Really HEPA filter added masks of various kinds, which can be used immediately. And there should be a market risk mitigation. So or their widespread dissemination is going to be very, very valuable. Similarly, having hospitals and rooms uh, in a manner which can be completely filtered. The second aspect is surge capacity. Uh, you know, surge capacity can deal with about uh, 20, 30, 40% at most, uh, but not two or three or four fold increase in requirement. So how does one deal with dramatic increase in requirements? Their rapid approaches to repurposing what is already going on in other sectors, which we have seen happen in the pandemic, needs to be amplified enormously. The last point I'd like to mention is in the drugs and pharma industry and the biotech industry. Here we need to mitigate risk enormously and go through widespread trials for different kinds of potential pathogens for epidemics and uh, pandemics, go through phase one and phase two trials and be ready should an outbreak occur or should an epidemic occur to amplify phase three trials very rapidly. This requires global cooperation. This requires enormous investment in R&D India has the appetite for that because, you know, um, these are the kinds of uh, epidemics we've learned from this current pandemic where rapid response is needed. Our regulatory structure finally has to be changed both in India and abroad in a manner where what took years to take decisions routinely now takes place in months. And that's something which we've learned from the pandemic and we need to embed it going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Vijay. Uh... Amitav and, and Vijay very nicely elucidated the next steps and the preparedness that we have to have. Naresh, you are a doctor, head of Medanta. You have seen how we are struggling to make enough vaccines in India to cover the population in the first round. I know that you're convinced that we need to work on building enough capacity for stockpiling in the future. And I'm sure you'll agree that we need to build surveillance and early warning systems for the future pandemics. So how do you think we should shape up our vaccine strategy in the context of our recent learnings and what you have encountered firsthand in Medanta? And how, how, do, you, how do you kind of build on what we heard from Amitabh and, and Vijay? And it'll be, it'll be important for us to understand what are those post-COVID opportunities that you see through your lens in R&D and manufacturing and how, how India could be pushed to seriously focus on innovation and R&D. Thank you, 
Naresh, are you on mute? Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. So, you know, from a provider point of view, what we experienced and what has already, some of it has been alluded to by Mr. Khan and Vijay Raghavan, is the point for the first time that in the beginning of the pandemic and through the, through the following year and the second wave, there has been a lot of realization of the interdependence of everybody per se, but more specifically between all of our sectors that may, that is government, private, innovators, scientists, and India did actually come together very nicely to have reached a point where we actually were quite well prepared for the second wave. But the happenings between the first and second wave were such that we invited, we invited a very high wave with a huge velocity and ferocity. And when people say whose fault is it, looking to blame somebody, it's all our fault. We all participated in it and we made it happen. So what are the lessons? One is the point which you were, you alluded to, uh, Amitabh also alluded to his fun, that we have, do not have today, that early warning system. That early warning system is well established. The concept is well established. We have in India the highest capability of producing IT tracking and connectivity. We have a huge broadband network laid by the government at the last level of the village. So all we need to do, and I'm sure it's work in progress right now, that this, this data collection from at real time coming into a war room, which can actually sensitize ourselves to say, where are the danger points and how fast we can react. Don't forget, we have such a huge population that preparation for that, stockpiling for that size of population with the amount and number of variety of things that may occur is a daunting task. But we should embark on that journey as soon as possible. And what this virus has thrown at us is a, is a twist and turn and surprise at every level. So where, where we thought that in the first wave, we had established enough infrastructure, enough manufacturing capacity to deal with, even if it was double the size. But nobody estimated it would be four times the size. To give you an example, the normal oxygen consumption of the medical delivery system in India, non-pandemic, was 2,200 tons a day of liquid oxygen. We reached a peak of 10,000 plus tons a day requirement around the country. And I must say, there were very difficult times. We, we spent three weeks, I did not sleep because we had 550 uh, COVID patients and another 250 non-COVID patients in our hospital. And we were looking at two, three hours of supply and at 750 to 800 lives at stake. So it was very harrowing moment, but I must compliment the government, which I, I mean, not necessary for me to do, but I will, that the government actually brought together all the resources with participation from industry, from participation from civil society, that we were able to overcome it. We lost some, but it could have been much huger if we were not that efficient. So let's put that aside. Now preparation for the future. So if you historically, the waves come between 30 to 35 weeks. So if that is the pattern that this virus is going to follow as happened in the Spanish flu, which it did in between the first and second wave, and we have some breathing time, we need to look at the, the things that we could do ASAP to one, protect the population from the maladies of what we suffered in the second wave. Second is the point, how do we protect across the board no matter where they reside, no matter what economic state that they reside in, that we can vaccinate, vaccinate, and vaccinate. So like Mr. Kant said, we have the capacity to go up to 10 million a day 
we can do it between the government and the private sector we have demonstrated if we can reach that we can flatten this wave this wave the third wave expectation by almost 70% so we know there are model modulations already done that if we were able to stuck stuck with only 50 100,000, 500,000 a day, I mean 50 lakhs, sorry, 5 million a day, we will flatten the lay or affect the wave by about 25 plus percent. If we can go up to 7 billion a day, we can flatten it below 50 percent. And if we can reach 10 billion a day, we would almost flatten it. So we know that. The only other thing that we did, we don't want to happen. is what that irresponsible covid behavior when we talk about responsible covid behavior we need to dig it and enforce it completely and that's in the hands of the government and the public and the private uh, uh, civil society to actually follow the rules which will help india to emerge from this malady intact because you know another uh, we may, may not be able to bear the third wave if it came with this velocity or even higher because of the economic burden and the human burden that we have seen in all the, in all this period so my point is yes we need to innovate we need to create that ecosystem and we must realize it's very easy to say the banner but research development r and d comes from an ecosystem unless we develop that whole entire ecosystem we will not be able to to be able to really succeed to the level we want to so we need to look at all the peripheral aspects of supporting r and d and hopefully in the next 5 years we would have reached our goal and start full steam to reach that goal of 2030 which which uh, uh, abhitab just talked about so i think india has all the means india needs to bring in discipline india needs to bring bring in the sensing systems of early warnings and also at the same time become build a robust r&d system which requires money which requires the whole ecosystem so the government can actually support hugely in this effort thank you thank you narish thank you very much uh now let me go to dilip uh, dilip while you can comment on the same point that you heard from uh, you heard the comments from amita vijay and naresh but i'll be very keen to also get your perspective on on yet another concept you know many global pharma companies are now seeking to provide equitable access of their innovative drugs through voluntary licensing in india as an operational ceo of a large pharma company how, how do you encourage how do you think we should encourage more companies and potential licenses to provide broader access to innovative drugs for indian patients what would be your recommendations on streamlining the pharmaceutical regulatory process no thank you sanat and uh, i think it's been an interesting discussion you asked very thought provoking questions uh, i believe that uh, both uh, mr kant as well as mr vijay raghavan have responded to the focus that we as a country have for innovation and how we have managed our uh, uh, pandemic if i look at uh, as a outsider then uh, i mean not as not from medical fraternity i think two things kind of came out very clearly one is the speed with which indian industry responded to the sudden upsurge in the demand for many drugs which were required for treatment of covid where in a period of less than 4 weeks from shortage products became available off the shelf uh, products like remdesivir as well as uh, let's say other drugs used in treatment of covid uh, dr trehan talked about the challenge we faced as a country in terms of uh, providing for oxygen and uh, i think uh, he has far more data than what i have but uh, what i think i can talk about from industry point of view 
is that many pharmaceutical companies, including Sun Pharma, uh, all of us use nitrogen uh, generation plant in our factories. And we converted seven of our nitrogen generation plant into oxygen generation plants and uh, shared that with the local hospitals thereby I believe that if all of them have cumulative capacity of providing oxygen to more than 1,500 patients on an ongoing basis. Uh, so I think uh, I saw a clear mix of uh, pragmatic government action at the same point of time, a concerted uh, of what you call industry and societal response to the challenge that we faced. I think uh, it, many Indians who were settled abroad, they also sent in a lot of essential treatment options for, uh, I, I believe you were part of one of them, to send so many things which were required for patients in India. So I, I think, uh, my belief is that we've managed the first, second wave of pandemic quite well. We are now from a peak of more than 400,000 patients, cases every day. Uh, we are now less, to, less than 50,000 in a period of less than maybe six, seven weeks. So that's a significant reduction and it reflects the concerted effort of the government as well as the state governments. Finally, I think our industry question you asked is very relevant in a discussion like this, because uh, ultimately innovation uh, is what will help us overcome the diseases which are currently inadequately treated and help provide better treatment options for patients. And uh, uh, I think uh, voluntary license is a extremely useful tool for ensuring that uh, drugs which are uh, required for treating patients, how do we improve the access to those drugs by licensing in many cases at very low royalty or almost no royalty uh, to the industry. As a company, Sun Pharma, I think uh, because we closely work with large number of international companies, we have uh, been able to license or we have been a licensee of all the voluntary licenses which companies have given. We've licensed products from Gilead. We've licensed a product for treatment of uh, COVID from Lilly. And uh, recently, I think... Uh, we also licensed a product from Merck, uh, where Merck decided to license this product to eight companies. And uh, for the first time in the country, I think all of these companies are doing a joint uh, clinical development so that this product can be registered fast in India. Uh, I believe that uh, uh, to maintain the future investment in uh, research, uh, companies and industry needs to be assured of uh, fair return on their investment. But at the same time, if some drugs are essential for treating any pandemic or a disease which where excess is important, a voluntary license will continue to encourage uh, this future investment. Uh, we are working with the government to see that uh, uh, because eight is a big number. So if there are eight companies marketing this and Lily is also licensed, their berries are turning to six or seven companies. So that will ensure easy access to drugs. <coughs> Hopefully, I think uh, we will be able to work with the government to ensure that uh, only voluntary licenses or govern the, uh, what you call, availability of product and uh, not through compulsory license. Because I believe that compulsory license uh, issued even though only once in the past gives 
India and Indian companies a bad uh, international uh, name and it needs to be protected against. Thank you. Thank you, Vijay. Thank you very much. So uh, we got the opportunity to ask this panel questions. Uh, now let's take the opportunity of uh, going to the audience and ask uh, a few questions, get a few questions from the, from the audience. Uh, there are uh, uh, quite a few important uh, guests we have in the audience. So I don't know uh, if they're all on. Uh, Chris Vibakar, Managing Partner, GoNet Point Capital. Chris, can you hear me? I can. Thank you, Sanat. And uh, if you can uh, state your question or comment and direct it to a single panelist or you'd like any one of them to comment, please state that too. Thank you, Chris. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. So I, I have been involved in the Global COVAX initiative, so I, I'm looking at this on a more global scale. Um, one of the things that we have seen uh, though that, uh, that China and Russia have actually been able to ramp up uh, production of vaccine very significantly. Um, and what we see is, is that the pandemic is, is not only a health crisis, but uh, certain countries are using their vaccine manufacturing uh, in exchange for trade and, and other geopolitical influence. Um, it's kind of surprising because I would have thought that India uh, would be uh, first out of, out of the gates. Is India now looking at what, what can India really do to really increase its, its global um, vaccine uh, manufacturing, which, which would include having uh, its vaccines uh, registered um, not only with the WHO under the uh, uh, pre-qualifying mechanism, but perhaps the EMA and, and, and FDA. Um, because there seems to be a, a huge opportunity for India really to not just serve its own population, but to, to become a global player um, in the, in, in the um, geopolitics of what's going on. Amitabh, Vijay, would you all like to take any one of you? So let me uh, say that our view is that this is not just a pandemic and uh, this is likely to become endemic. And uh, therefore, India needs to actually uh, build up capacity to produce about 300 million uh, doses a month. And that means that we should be able to vaccinate our entire population every four months and then be able to build capacity to export vaccines across the world. Not merely be a powerhouse to meet the needs for the domestic market, but look at exporting across the world. And that is why we have a range of uh, vaccines presently, other than Covaxin and uh, Covishield, which is being manufactured uh, by Serum Institute and Bharat Biotech doing Covaxin. We have a range of uh, new vaccines which are coming into India. And uh, you have e-biological tie up with Johnson and Johnson. You have uh, Covaxin with Novavax, which Serum Institute is doing. You have Zydus uh, Cadilla coming in with uh, an, their vaccine, which is going to be licensed soon. So we have actually 12 different candidates of vaccines coming in. And our expectation is that by uh, December, we would have uh, been, we should have been producing close, we would have produced close to about uh, 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 close to about 1,300 to 1,400 million uh, of these uh, uh, COVID vaccines. And uh, I, my personal vision is that uh, uh, India will end up, once it has populated, once it has inoculated its own population, India will end up exporting to the rest of the world. In fact, not merely exporting, but it is already exported. India is probably the only country which has demonstrated that uh, you can't be safe if till everybody is not safe and therefore India has actually exported a lot of the vaccines produced in India to other parts of the world and our view is that this is a global fight and globally we have to fight to save the entire humanity even one person with COVID in any part of the world will actually be spreading it to other parts of the world. So this is not a fight for India producing vaccines. It's about the entire world producing vaccines to save.
the global humanity and the global community and therefore india will do its best indian entrepreneurs are out totally top class as far as vaccine manufacturing is concerned we've been the vaccine factory of the world and we will continue to make manufacturing continue to innovate continue to part, uh, partner with other vaccine manufacturer and continue uh, to uh, enhance our production capacity not only for india but for the rest of the world thank you amita there are two other questions uh, from the audience uh, without uh, and we don't have much time so let me go over to those questions the next one is from alka goel founding partner alchemy growth Cap capital alka can you hear me yes i can thank you thank you so much for this opportunity and it's it's been a very reflective and engaging session so thank you sanat just a little bit of my background so that you understand my vantage point i spent 17 years at mckinsey working with very large companies and now i am running a fund in health and wellness uh, in india so really close to the ground floor on innovation in india just as an example we meet three new companies in healthcare and wellness every week so my question is actually for uh, Mr. Sangvi and Dr. Trehan. Um, what are the areas uh, that you see technology will have a huge impact from your operating model? Where are you most worried and what are the plans you're making in your businesses uh, to use technology so that we can shape uh, and disrupt healthcare in the future? Yeah, Dr. Dr. To be, thank you. Thank you, Alka. So, one thing that we have seen is a transformation of our entire working model from what we thought would take five, seven years to do in the digitization process, in the remote delivery space, that it all got compressed in a few months. So, today, just to give you an example, Pre-COVID, we used to do about 100 consultations, teleconsults or video consults with patients remotely. Today, we are doing upwards of 700 a day. So, across all specialties. So, we see, I mean, sometimes it becomes very uh, demanding in the sense that as I'm talking to you, my secretary just handed me a huge pile of consultations I still have to do through the night. So, it has changed, no question. And it has changed in two ways. One, of course, the multiplier effect that one expert can talk to people anywhere in the country or anywhere in the world. Two, it saves the patients. So typically, if you look at my practice, they would have to come with their angiogram, pay a visit, you'd advise them, they'll go home, and they would travel from a thousand kilometers or more. And they, they would then you give them a date and they would come. And then, so it was a huge burden on them, time-wise, effort-wise, money-wise. Today, we look at it, we are face-to-face, -face, we tell them what we think is the right procedure for them, and they come, they get a date, and they come prepared with everything. So, you know, all these things have made a big difference to give relief from the patient's point of view. From medicine point of view, it has increased the efficacy and safety for patients, like we are doing EICUs. So today, the multiplier effect of one ICU expert to 10 other ICUs to make rounds with them in the, uh, every day is a huge relief. So that's one thing that has actually happened. Now, of course, we know that AI, deep learning, virtual reality, augmented reality, all these things were in the horizon. But today, all of them have been activated. So at that end, there is the IT space. The other is that how do we increase the safety of the patient as we move forward? So there is a lot of innovation we are partnering with, with, the, with companies, the startups, with biotech companies to say, where can we do together development of new modalities to increase the safety of the patient? And second is how to to compress research, like you see what happened in the vaccine development. We know that we are faced with huge challenges by way of, it, you know, not only viruses are transforming, bacteria is also uh, transforming. And more and more of them will need 
faster and faster discovery of drugs to handle very serious infections. As the population grows older, these demands will become much more. So I can go on and on and on. But no question, the face of way we practice medicine, way we service patients, and the way we look at technology has had a huge transformation. That's the upside of this whole malady that we are experiencing. Thank you, Thank you Naresh. Uh, if you don't mind, I want to go over to the next question because we're running short of time. And this is from Robert Califf, Head of Clinical Policy and Strategy, Verily and Google Health. Robert, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you just fine. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Please go ahead. Great. So I guess this has been a great discussion. I know we're short on time, so I'll just ask it um, quickly. Uh, obviously, you know, we're contending with this enormous pandemic and it's been a great discussion of how innovation has made a difference there. But we have an even larger wave of chronic disease, which is affecting both the U.S. and India. You know, we're seeing a decline in life expectancy in the U.S. year after year now for six out of the last seven years, um, while India has this enormous population uh, coming into the phase of, of chronic disease. What, what are the lessons that have been learned that can be applied to chronic disease from the pandemic? And I, I know the time is short, so um, quick answers I know are needed. Yeah, Vijay and Naresh, perhaps this is up your alley. Well, so, I'll be very, very brief so that Naresh can add on uh, from a clinical perspective. Very simply, the idea of chronic disease has got two components, one lifestyle, and should there be disease, then, you know, delivery of care. Both require, the first requires massive communication and changes in lifestyle to a healthier one. The second requires delivery of personalized medicine, which in the West is extremely expensive. And we need to work out ways through our major national digital health mission, other missions, to make sure that we can deliver personalized health care in a frugal, frugal manner. That, that really is feasible. We have learned that. We heard from Naresh about some examples. But scaling that up will really address chronic disease also. Naresh. So the seeds of chronic disease are laid from childhood. The way, whole thing about building a country's health system was to build that stack. And I must say that in the current dispensation from the government, the creation of the concept of Ayushma has roots which can actually make a big difference at the ground level. So in India, of course, there's a double opportunity. Chronic diseases which are lifestyle and chronic diseases which are uh, due to lack of civic amenities. So we need to work on both ends, uh, Rob. And we need to, we, from this primary health center concept, which we call the wellness center, once we have enough network, we would have actually been able to improve the sanitation, the, the hygiene, the nutrition on the ground, which is the building block. Now, if you're on the other hand, as, uh, as we are saying, today we are looking at medicine as not only curative, not only early detection, but preventive and predictive. So the question really is when we get to the sophistication of predictive medicine and apply it to our population at large, we would have actually made a big difference in the evol evolving chronic diseases. So I think all this thing is in, in the planning. How effectively we execute it is going to be the proof of the pudding. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there any other question anybody else has? Well... Thank you all very much. It was, it was a very good uh, discussion and I really thank the panelists. And as I said, necessity is the mother of invention. We have seen India do a lot of things in the last many years. And I'm quite sure in the next years, we will see India rising up to the challenge and leading from the front, also in the area of innovation. Thank you all very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Sanat. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Session. Can you put the slide, please?
Can you put the polling slide? Yeah. Thank you, Sanat, for a wonderful, uh, you know, excellent, you know, in-depth panel over there. Can you put the uh, polling slide? The poll is now open for a minute. Please go ahead and start polling. We are running a bit late, so we try to make it up. We overshot this panel by seven minutes. We have about 40 minutes, 40 seconds left. Question is, what does India need to do to ensure it is better prepared for the next pandemic? We have 30 seconds left. Looks like a very exciting question. The poll is going to end soon. Thank you. The poll has ended. We'll see you after four minutes. The concept of Medanta, the desire to build it, came from the fact India needed its own institution which would provide the best treatment available anywhere in the world. There are four billion people who are in the same shape as India is. And if you are going to try to keep copy, become a copycat of the Western medicine which the Americans can't afford themselves, it is important for us to develop our own medicine develop therapies equally effective half the cost. Pursuant to this vision, the Medanta Research Unit is nested within the 1250 bedded hospital and conducts clinical trials at a proof of concept phase one unit, evaluating vaccines for malaria, chicken, and several studies in cancer therapies, including dendritic cell and immunotherapies. Phase two clinical trials are of immense interest expedite access to innovative therapies and the unit also conducts clinical trials for stem cell therapies for cardiac and vascular use new addressings for reconstructive surgery new drugs and devices team has access also to half a million pathological blocks for biomarker work the recently inaugurated HIPAA compliant tissue repository is currently focusing on breast cancer and rare parathyroid cancers. The research team has access to over 3,500 outpatient visits, 900 hospital admissions and over 75 surgeries a day in this tertiary care hospital. Several clinical databases and registries have been created and we are the highest Asian recruiters in the international registries for aortic dissection. We have existing hospital-based vector borne disease registries and are part of the National Cancer Grid and the National Cancer Registries. This makes enrollment of patients into clinical trials quick and efficient. The research team is also working towards creation of a GCP-compliant clinical trial network and has expanded to geographically cover all of India. Immense focus is on patient safety, antibiotic stewardship and development of clinical decision support systems. We are taking research to the villages through public health programs using various innovations and telemedicine in cancer, tuberculosis and vector-borne diseases. Teams are busy also conducting research in Ayurveda, looking at well-designed randomized control trials for classical and proprietary medicine, whether for viral diarrheas or for COVID-19, in order to break the barriers to integrating traditional systems of medicine into modern care. Hello, everybody, and welcome back. Uh, Sanat, big, big thanks to you and to the entire panel on India innovation. So if we could please bring up the polling question, let's see what our audience had to say to the last poll. Get that online, and I'm just gonna 
make that larger on my screen so I can see it. There we go. Oops, sorry. There we go. So the question that all of you addressed was, what does India need to do to better ensure its preparedness for the next pandemic? And there was a clear answer with only 50, almost 50% 50 of you thinking, believing that in order for India to be better prepared, it needs to improve vaccine deployment infrastructure. So thank you very much for participating in our poll. And as mentioned earlier, we will continue with these polling questions uh, throughout the day.